Well, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Blake. I am one of the pastors here at the Refuge Church. And um, it's uh, my joy to be able to be able to uh, talk to you guys again and be able to preach again today. Uh, I had the privilege of preaching last week, so I get to do two weeks in a row, which is a lot of fun for me. Uh, even though some of you are uh, eager to get Scott back in the pulpit, I kicked him out so I could preach again. So uh, it's just how it goes, and he has to listen to me. So, uh, but again, we're just really glad that y'all are here. Um, it's, it's a joy to do this. And as you can see from our screens, we are back in Acts. Amen, right? That is right. So because we're back in Acts, you're going to need a Bible because I'm telling you, we are covering a lot of ground today, okay? So if you don't have a Bible, what I need you to do is raise your hand up high, and one of our blue shirts are going to bring one to you, okay? And it, uh, so those of you that do have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Acts chapter 1. So, uh, yeah, if you don't have a Bible, again, grab one. Uh, if you don't own a Bible at all, please, that is our gift to you. So take it home, and uh, we would love for that to, to be our gift to you. Now, um, I know that some of you right now are sweating a little bit because you, you're thinking, did he say Acts chapter 1? And uh, the answer is yes, we said Acts chapter 1. So the question is, are we starting over? Because as you know, we've been walking through Acts since uh, February of last year, so a lot of time. And so are we starting over? The answer is yes, because we honestly don't feel like y'all been paying attention closely enough, okay? So, um, so we're, I need y'all to buckle up, pay attention. We're starting with Acts chapter 1, Okay. I'm kidding a little bit, just a little bit. So what we're going to do, we know that we've taken a break from Acts. We know that uh, two weeks ago we had uh, Resurrection Sunday, so we got to celebrate with Christians all over the world, celebrating the risen Jesus. Uh, last week we got to uh, take a pause and a huge milestone in the life of our church with what we call a Commissioning Sunday, which uh, actually Caleb's right here standing up. I'm going to, uh, but he's a, <laughs> oh, so Caleb and his wife Shelly were able to launch a new gospel community group last week, and so we took a break to be able to talk about that as well. So today we get to launch back into Acts. So uh, several weeks ago, though, you'll probably know, remember that uh, Scott finished Acts chapter 16, and if you're looking in your Bibles, you'll notice how many chapters does Acts have? My Bible trivia guys are like on it right now, right? So 28 chapters is what you'll see, okay? So you'll know that, so now that we finish Acts chapter 16, that puts us a little over a halfway point of where we are in Acts. And so we decided as a pastoral team that now that we're easing back into Acts, we're gonna take a break again today in Acts and we're gonna do a review of the things that we've talked about so far. And so I know that's a lot, a lot to do, right? Because we, like, we spent 38 sermons uh, over a year to preach through all of the 16 chapters of Acts, and I'm going to try to do it in one sermon. So I'm not saying I'm a better preacher than Scott, but you do the math, okay? So, uh, but what I want you to see, so again, we're taking, well, whenever, what we do here at Refuge, ex expository preaching is of utmost importance to us. And what that means is we, we walk verse by verse through a book of the Bible. And the reason we do that is because we don't like to take 60,000 foot views of things. We want to get down in the weeds with things and really wrestle with the text that the Lord gives us. And so that's what we've been doing. That's why it's taken us over a year to get through only 16 chapters of Acts. So today, to, give it, to kind of get us caught back up before we jump into Acts chapter 17 next week, is we are going to take that higher view of everything we've covered so far. So then we do get back into the weeds, and I say that positively, not negatively, of, of Acts chapter 17 next week. We're all caught up with where we've been and what we've covered so far. So what I want you to see, the main thing that I know, that as, again, if we're going to summarize the things that we've read so far, the biggest thing that I want you to walk away with today is I want you to be encouraged that God is building his church, Right? God is building his church. That is the thing that we are going to see over and over and over throughout the, uh, throughout the first 16 chapters of Acts. And honestly, all of Acts. But that's the main thing that we're going to see as we look at this. So I believe that by revisiting these things as a church family, we're going to be reminded, encouraged, and emboldened by the goodness of God that we're going to see in these first 16 chapters of Acts. And we're going to see uh, that God will finish what he started. Amen, church? God will finish what he started. So we're going to take it right from the top if you can. We're, uh, go to Acts chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to read the first 11 verses together. In this first book, O Theophilus, just, just so you know, if you're not familiar with this, Theophilus is the same person that Luke wrote his gospel to uh, back in the gospel of Luke. Uh, Acts being written by Luke is actually one big work, if you want to look at it that way, the Acts, uh, Luke-Acts gospel. Um, so, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up 
after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he had said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that, uh, that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses, say witnesses, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Say end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up with a cloud and took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by him in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And again, this is the word of God given for us, for our edification, and for us to know more of the love of our Father for us. So with Jesus' resurrection, hope had been restored to his followers. We, as we recounted over the last several weeks, you know, obviously with the death of Jesus, his uh, disciples, uh, that hope had been lost. But with his glorious resurrection, hope had been restored. But Jesus, as he ascended into heaven, he didn't leave them alone, did he? Just as Jesus was with the disciples during the three and a half year ministry on earth, the Holy Spirit would be with him in this new era, the era that we call the church, the era that we are in right now. So the question is now what? Now that Jesus is gone, or at least not on earth anymore, what did the disciples do? Keep reading with me in Acts chapter, starting in verse, uh, verse 12. When they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey, and when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All of these were with one accord, devoting themselves to prayer together with the, woman and, uh, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers." So this is arguably one of the most pivotal points in the history of the church. When they were organizing themselves to play out what Jesus had commanded them to do, to go and be a witness to the ends of the earth. So the question is, how did they start? What's the first thing they did? Before they went to the street corners, before they started to tell everyone the good news, but before they, they, they started going into the houses of all their friends and family, what is the first thing they did? But before, before they got into Photoshop and started making all those little pamphlets that look like $100 bills, but when you look at them more closely, they're actually tracks of the gospel. What's that, what is it they did before that? They devoted themselves to prayer. Now, I wanted to stop. I know this is the very beginning. We have a lot of ground to cover over this, but I couldn't help myself at stopping to realize that after Jesus' ascension, what is the first thing the disciples did when they had to take on the, the, the words that Jesus had given them as they go out with power? They stopped to pray. I want to make sure that we didn't miss the example that these early followers of Jesus gave. Now, I also have to ask, when you're reading that, is anyone else as convicted as I am by that? It's just me? Okay. I guess y'all are much holier than I am, which is probable. So, uh, but yeah, but this is something that I honestly, I want, I want to see more of that in my life. Because just to be frank, a lot of times my reaction to something big in my life, my reaction to some, a big decision I have to make or something, a lot of times it's not prayer. And I wish it was. That's something that I have been asking the Lord in prayer to give more and more in my life. And I'm just saying that just to be honest and expose myself a little bit because I know that I'm not alone in this room. But I just find it as such a great um, comfort knowing that that's exactly what the earlier disciples did is they stopped and devoted themselves to prayer something that i'm asking the lord to put more and more into my heart as well and i hope that you're, you um, hope the same for you but if they're to live in the spirit we must listen to the spirit we must spend time with the lord we must abide in him and we do that in his word in prayer so let's keep going so so if we were to summarize all of chapter one as the disciples were, uh, the summarization would be the uh, disciples were preparing 
to go out and be disciples and to be witnesses, as Jesus said, throughout all of the, all, to the ends of the earth. The pre- preparation would be a good um, encapsulating word for Acts, uh, Acts chapter 1. And that's exactly what they did. And even as we see, as they're uh, getting towards the end of chapter 1, we see them even casting lots to, in accordance with the scriptures, the prophecies, and they elect Matthias to, to uh, replace Judas the betrayer as one of the disciples and the apostles that they needed to have. And that moves us into Acts chapter 2. And Acts chapter 2 is where we really start to see the plane get off the runway when it comes to taking the gospel message out to, uh, to the, rest of the rest of the world. So read with me. We're going to read uh, in chapter, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were, they were dwelling in, uh, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And the sound of the multitude came together. They were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how, and how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthenians and Medes and Elamites and the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of the, uh, Libya belong to Cyrene and visitors of Rome. Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking, saying, They're filled with new wine. So remember way back in John chapter 16, Jesus told them, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. We see here in Acts chapter 2 that Jesus kept his promise by sending the helper to his church. And the Holy Spirit got to work right away, didn't he? The Spirit allowed these guys to speak languages they didn't know so that others around them could hear the gospel. But it says that other guys just thought they were drunk. So that's a a whole other story, right? So, of course, Peter's going to Peter, and he had to buck up and respond to that, right? So he basically said, no, we're not drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning, guys. But what we are is we are a fulfillment of the prophecies that you'll see in the Old Testament scriptures. And then he goes on to preach one of the best sermons that have ever been preached. I would go... encourage you to go and read it this week. I actually thought about just reading it for y'all today and me going and sitting down because it's amazing. And there's nothing I can add to it, okay? But he hit them right between the eyes with the gospel truth. And he was clear too. He even said in verse 21, if you look at it, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Say, will be saved. And after he finishes, we see the crowd's response to Peter's sermon in verse 37. Uh, Read with me and uh, check. Chapter verse 37, uh, starting in verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about how many? 3,000. What shall we do? They asked. Simple. Repent and believe. Repent and be baptized. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. And the result, we read that 3,000 people did just that. They repented and believed in Jesus and were baptized. God is building his church. Whether it be one soul at a time or 3,000, God is building his church. So again, we must pause and we have to allow, as we're reading this text, we must allow it to read us. That's what scripture does to us, right? And the question is this, have you repented and believed? Have you done that? Have you called upon the name of the Lord? 
or as Paul puts it in Romans, confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, which means that you have submitted all of your life to following Jesus. Have you done that? Surely there's some in this room who have not yet. If you have, praise God. If you haven't yet, what are you waiting on? Why not? If you're waiting for a sign, there's a guy on a stage with his voice asking you, why haven't you submitted your life to Jesus yet? No matter how uncomfortable I'm making you right now, I'm making you struggle with that question. Why haven't you submitted your life to Jesus? Do you have questions about Jesus or the Bible? There are a plethora of people here today that would be eager and joyed to talk to you about that. We're going to have pastors standing at the back during the next song after I preach. They would, be, they would love to talk to you about it. So if the reason you haven't yet given your life to Jesus because you have questions about him or questions about the Bible, come talk to us right now. Don't keep putting it off. Maybe there's some of you who, when asked, when did you become a Christian, you can't really point to a specific time when you can confess for the first time, but maybe your answer is, well, I've just always grown up in church. I'm here to tell you, that's not a faith, that's a heritage, and a heritage will not save you. Only belief in Jesus Christ will. So if that's your answer, I'm not saying that to bring more condemnation on you. I'm, bringing this, I'm saying this out loud because I want you to evaluate it. I want you to evaluate, why have I not confessed with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead? I'm not talking about the, the belief that your mom passed down to you because she took you to church every Sunday, Wednesday. I'm talking about how do you believe in your heart? And if the answer is no, come talk to us about today. Because what if today is the day you get to say, yes, I finally believe. That invitation is open to you right now. So we're going to have pastors in the back after this to do that. But I couldn't read uh, Peter's sermon and not ask that question of you today. So let's keep going because we have a lot of, a lot of ground to cover as we continue in Acts chapter 2. As we keep moving through the rest of chapter 2, we see that the radical faith led them to live in radical ways. If you look in, in uh, verse 42, we see how their faith caused them to live out what they believed. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So we see here in the early church, as we see next to what their faith did is it caused them to live radically generous, radically um, hospitable lives. The Holy Spirit was working in them and shaping their hearts to make them more and more Christ-like, and that caused them to live in these radically different ways. And then, I, then we move into chapter 3. As we, as we move through Acts chapter 3 and even 4, we see the apostles continuing to go throughout the area, preaching and performing healings. Over and over, we see that the people are, it says that they're filled with wonder and amazement at what they're hearing and seeing, all glory going to God. But Peter is staying on message as he preaches. We read this in, in Acts chapter, uh, in verse uh, 19 of chapter 3. Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Over and over, Peter is staying on message as he's bringing this gospel truth to the masses. He's hitting people again right between the eyes with the truth of the gospel. So, and I would say, Christian, I'd encourage you to do the same. When presented with the opportunity to share the gospel with someone, notice I said when and not if. When you are presented with the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, don't pull any punches, okay? Trust that the Spirit is using the clear, exclusive gospel to save sinners like you, to save sinners like me. That's what he did for me. That's what he did for you if you call, if you call yourself a Christian. Don't worry about offending. Don't worry that they not like, might not like part of it. Share with them that they're a sinner in need of a Savior, and that Savior's name is Jesus Christ. That's what we share with people. And here's the thing. They probably will be offended because the gospel is offensive, is it not? 
It forces us to humble ourselves. It forces us to admit that there is something I need outside of myself to bring salvation to my to myself, to, there's something I need outside of myself to restore my relationship with my heavenly father. But what you do is we pray that the spirit will use that offense to continue to soften their hearts to the point where they're able to confess and believe that they need Jesus and they really believe it that time. So Christian, don't pull punches when you speak, speak in truth, also in love, so don't try to offend them, but don't pull punches because you're afraid of how they might react. Trust that the Spirit is going before you, just as we see in Acts, and, and doing the heavy lifting for you. Because here's the thing, it's not up to you to save people. It's not up to you to convince people. It's up to you to tell people the gospel truth and to speak clearly and boldly and confidently that the Spirit is going to do the work that only he can do. So your job is to be obedient. Just be obedient to sharing the good news. And that's what Peter did, and God used it in mighty ways to continue to build the early church. And so, speaking of being offensive, that's exactly what we see in Acts chapter 4, because we see the apostles have a, a run-in with the greatly annoyed religious leaders of that time. The apostles get hauled before a council and bombarded with questions. And how do they respond? Well, in Acts chapter 4, verse 18, we see uh, one of Peter's responses. So they, the council, called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. They speak with boldness and truth. Even to the same council that sent Jesus to his crucifixion. It was the same council. They knew that as they were talking to them, but yet he didn't alter his bold claim and bold promise that he's not going to do what they say because the gospel must continue to go forward. Then, they're released, and we see them continue to go and encourage believers through the rest of Acts chapter 4. And then in Acts chapter 5, we see them get arrested again. And we're told, again, to stop preaching. And Peter's response to the council this time is also just as amazing. Look in Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 29. Read this with me. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. And God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at the right hand as a leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. For we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The bold confidence of the apostles continue. That's what we see as they continue to get bombarded with these questions from these guys. Nothing is going to stop the spread of the good news. And then as we move into Acts chapter 6, we see more structure being added to the church. But we also see more opposition being pushed against her. Uh, in Acts, chapter one, uh, Acts 6, starting in verse 1, we read, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in a number of a complaint by the Hellenists, which were the, which were the Greek-speaking believers, arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So it's here that we see the office of deacon created uh, there in the church. And it's an office that's still around today. So again, this is another one of those things that the reason that we operate at the Refuge Church here in 2024 is because it's what we see in the scriptures, specifically with the building of the office of deacon. And I gotta tell you, the 11 deacons that are serving you, church, here at Refuge, do an incredible job. Scott Cockroft, Eric Eskew, Dustin and Siri Gaskins, Larry Lewis, Kevin and Cindy Pickering, Jeff and Lindsay Reese, Carla Scott, and Dawson Stockdale. Those are the 11 deacons that we have right now. And if you have a chance, I know that they're crawling under a seat right now because they don't even want me to say it out loud. But if you run into them today, please stop them and thank them for the work that most people will never see them do because most of it's behind the scenes. But they serve you, church, so well. And I'm so glad that the Lord saw fit to build this structure in the church because we see how it works, not only them, but thousands of years later to serve you, church, well. So for those who I just mentioned, thank you for the work that you do for your church. Uh, most of it does go unnoticed, I have to admit, but I know that there's so much that you do uh, that just, it wouldn't work without you, and we appreciate you. So 
Um, back then, we see that one of the seven that are chosen is this guy named, C, uh, guy named Stephen. And it's with him at the end of chapter 6 that we see the opposition level up against the church. Stephen is arrested, and after some false accusations are brought against him, they, uh, they start to question him even more harshly. And then in Acts chapter 7, pre, uh, Stephen preaches a sermon, again, that rivals Peter's, to be honest, because what he does is he essentially, for most of chapter 7, outlines the entire story of God up to that point and shows how it all points to the person of Jesus Christ. Which, as you can imagine, the religious leaders of that time didn't like that at all. So they decided... Um, because of this, they lined up expert witnesses, they lined up uh, accounts, and they had people build false testimonies against him so that they could put him to death. And unfortunately, that's exactly what they did because we see um, that he becomes the first Christian martyr uh, outlined in the Gospels. The opposition was so strong that they were willing to lie, cheat, just to destroy the spread of God's Gospel. But did it work? Of course not. God is building his church. And nothing can stop God. If God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. That's who. Nobody. No one can be against us who God is. Although tragic, the martyrdom of Stephen did the opposite of what those leaders intended. It only served to fan the flames of the gospel spread. And we see right as we entered in chapter 8 that we read about this guy named Saul who approved of Stephen's death. And later on, we, le- we hear that he is ravaging the church, this soul. But that didn't stop them from, quote, being Jesus' witnesses beyond Jerusalem, just as Jesus had charged them to do. Philip, one of the disciples, goes, uh, goes to witness to the Samaritans when he comes across an Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, read with me in Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem to worship and, uh, and was returning, seated in a chariot, and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join his chariot. So Philip ran up to him and heard him reading the Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. What an opportunity. Hey, what you reading? Isaiah. Cool. What's it about? No idea. Can you tell me about it? Absolutely. And he hops in. what What an amazing opportunity that was for Philip. And it says that Philip hopped in and told him the good news about Jesus. After which the eunuch got saved and was baptized on the spot. How cool is that? Now, don't you wish that sharing your faith was that easy? Don't you wish that someone just outright asks you, can you explain the Bible to me? Don't you wish it was that easy? Here's the thing. A lot of times, it is that easy. If you're listening and praying for the opportunity. If you're listening to what people are telling you, if you're listening for the opportunity to explain the gospel to someone, it may be the full it or just the full gospel or maybe just part of it to, to, that, that interacts with their life in a time of sorrow, the opportunities are all around you if you train your eyes and train your ears to look and listen for it. So I'll, I'll tell you, Christian, pray for those opportunities and pray that God gives you the eyes and gives you the ears to look and hear for those opportunities because I promise you it will come a lot quicker than you realize. It is that easy if you listen for it. So be ready for it, because God's going to use you in mighty ways to share the gospel with your friends and family and coworkers and classmates. Again, Christian, be bold and listen to the leading of the Spirit, just as Philip did, because you have no idea what he's already doing to soften the ground for you before you get there. The opportunities are all around. Just listen for it. And then we move into Acts chapter 9. Here's the first eight verses. But Saul, yes, the same guy that was ravaging the church and who approved the murder of Stephen, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus so that he found any belonging to the way or the people following Jesus, men or women, he might bring them and bound to Jerusalem. 
Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but not seeing anyone. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. God is building his church. He's even converting the harshest opponents to the church in order to build it. Think about it. The very guy whose job it was to systematically kill Christians, the guy who was literally on his way to get a list of people he could arrest and drag back to, to be persecuted, God saves them, transforms them, and then he goes on to write about half the New Testament. But don't let the weight of that be lost on you. That's a huge deal. So I'll, I'll say that to say this. No one is too far gone for the Lord. No one is too far gone to, for you to be part of his church. Let that also be an encouragement to you because that one person that you think would never, ever, ever become a Christian, they are not too far gone for the reach of the Holy Spirit. Amen? You are not too far gone for the reach of the Holy Spirit. No matter how bad you think you are, you are not too far gone for the reach of the Holy Spirit. So that person is well within. You are well within his reach. So pray for that to happen because we know that God is able to make it happen. And pray expectingly that he does. I know all of us have someone in mind right now for that, even if it's you. And that's exactly what the early church did. And we see later in, in, uh, in the chapter, in verse 31, so the church throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. God is building his church. Nothing can stop it. Say nothing can stop it. Nothing can stop God from building his church. And then in Acts chapter 10, we see Peter sent out to preach specifically for the Gentiles or the, or the people that aren't Jewish. The Lord even invites, uh, gives him a vision of a sheet being brought down with all kinds of animals on it that Jews aren't supposed to eat. And God tells him to go and eat it. He says, of course I can't do that. I mean, you know, that's against the rules. And God says, what I have made clean, let no man call unclean. And so God uses that as this powerful reminder to Peter, who grew up Jewish, that he is breaking down the things that differentiate Jews and Greeks, because uh, Jews and, and non-Jews. And he's using that as a powerful testimony to Peter to go and pre as he's preaching to the Gentiles that everybody, whether Jew or non-Jew, what they need is Jesus to save them, not their dietary restrictions or anything else. God used that as a powerful reminder to Peter and to us that what saves us is not what we do, but in whom we place our trust. Named who? Jesus. That is what saves us. Nothing else. And then as we move into Acts chapter 11, we see Jesus charge the apostles, continue to move with power. They take Jesus' charge and continue to grow and move with power. Remember, Jesus charged them to be his witnesses from Jerusalem all the way to the ends of the earth. And that's exactly what we see happening. This is where another really cool thing happens. Look in verse 25, uh, chapter 11, verse 25 with me. So Barnabas, who was one of the other prominent disciples and preachers, went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So I just had to mention it just because I think it's really cool that, to see where our name came from. Though if you call yourself Christian, this is where it comes from. And it's a perfect name for what we are because it shows that the focus of our faith is on Jesus, who is the Christ, the Messiah, the Holy One who reconciles us back to our Father. If you are called Christian, this is where it comes from. I just, I couldn't help but mention that as I came to it. But the gospel message spreads across the earth. Unfortunately, so does prosecution. In Acts chapter 12, we see that King Herod martyrs James, the brother of John. Herod sees that as he kills him, that that makes the Jewish leaders happy of that time. And, uh, and so he turns right around and arrests Peter, arrests Peter again. Um, so Peter's arrested again, this time by the king, not just the, uh, the, the religious council. 
But again, nothing can stop God from building his church. Read with me in chapter 12, starting in verse 6. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, Peter, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries before the door and guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell, chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to them, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter's not just in front of the council this time. He's in like big boy jail, like the Herod's jail, okay? But God busts him out because nothing can stop God. Nothing can stop God. Even being in one of the tightly controlled prisons, God's going to get you out if that's what he chooses to do. And then in chapter 13, we see the church at Antioch. Again, the first people that, that called themselves Christians, they commissioned Paul and Barnabas out as missionaries. Paul, of course, is also called Saul, the same guy that he saved on that road to Damascus, that, who wrote much of, the, much of the New Testament. And it says that the church laid hands on them as they sent them out of the church of Antioch. So if you were here last week, you'll see that that's exactly what we did for the new gospel community group that we launched in, um, in, in Bartlett. We brought them up to the front, and our elders, we laid hands on them, and while the whole church prayed for them as we are sending them out as missionaries. And the reason we do that is because we read about it in Acts. Again, the way that we do church here at Refuge, we want to emulate everything that we see and in, in what we see in Scripture. And we see people being sent out as missionaries into the mission field, whether it be the ends of the earth or whether it be the next town over called Bartlett. And so we got to pray for them. And so last week was yet another example of how we get to continue to take the baton that's been passed for centuries to us as followers of Jesus. And we get to continue the things that we read about in scriptures. And again, I just think that is super cool that we get to do the things that we read about in scripture. And then we move on to chapter 14. Now that we've seen, now that they've been sent off by the church of Antioch, Chapter 14 outlines their travels as they're being sent out. And if you read, you'll read that it is rough, rough for these guys. In the first part of chapter 14, we see them get run out of Iconium because the Jews and the Gentiles were sharply divided and a crew of folks were looking to stone them. Now, as, I don't know if you remember when Scott showed you what stoning looks like, but stoning is not throwing pebbles at someone because it's annoying. They're getting like big like rocks the size of this fern or whatever, as big, as big as they can carry and heaping it at people's heads to try to kill them. Okay, that's what stoning is. It's nothing cute. It's something that a bunch of people are throwing giant rocks at you in order to murder you. That's what stoning is, okay? So Paul and Barnabas, they head out of, they get out of town and they go over to Lystra and they continue to preach the gospel and heal people of their ailments. However, in verse 19, we find that even though they left the trouble of, of uh, Antioch and Iconium, that trouble is coming back to find them. It says that their Jewish opponents in those cities uh, came and stirred up the crowds into a mob against Paul, and they actually do take hold of him and stone him to the point where they think he's dead. And remember, stoning is something that they, they would have been familiar with what stoning looks like, and so they would have been familiar with what it looks like for a person to be dead from stoning. And so don't think that he had like a little Band-Aid here and a scratch on his arm. Like he was bloody, beaten to a pulp to the point where they thought he was dead. So apparently he wasn't breathing or whatever it was. They thought he was dead. So what they do, they drag his body outside the city gates. And then what we find is that the, it says when the disciples came and were gathering around him, Paul sat up and he walked back into the city to go find Barnabas. So wild stuff. They thought he was dead. But God, I, I see that as a miracle of God, maybe even literally raising him from the dead. As, uh, but even if he was like barely alive, do you think you could get and stand up and walk back into a city being bloodied and beaten? Probably not. So I personally see this as yet another miracle of God, helping give someone strength that they do not have to continue the gospel message pushing forward. So in the future, when we're commissioning a new gospel community group, please pray specifically that they're not met like these guys were in, uh, in, in these cities, okay? Because we definitely don't want that for the Osbournes as they're leading this new GC out in, the, uh, out in uh, Bartlett, okay? We don't see stoning happening a lot, but you never know. So. And then we continue on to verse chapter, uh, chapter 15. 
we see the continued opposition. But this time we see the opposition coming from within the church. Uh, Verse 1 it says, But some came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So we got some guys teaching that you must be circumcised, literally, in order to be saved. And Paul and Barnabas weren't having it because they saw this as people adding to the gospel, the very clear gospel that they've been preaching all along. So let, me, let this serve as a reminder of us today that Jesus saves, period. Jesus saves Peter. As Peter would say in his, in his sermon that we already read, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Simple. Repent. Believe. So again, I'll say to some of you in this room who thought you got off the hook for earlier, repent and believe. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting to maybe be cleaned up a little bit more before you can finally come to Jesus? Stop adding to the gospel. Peter didn't say, Paul and all the writers that we see, the gospel that are clear, they don't say, get yourself cleaned up to a certain point and then repent and believe. Repent and believe. Come as you are because you're a mess as you are, just like I am, but Jesus wants your mess because he's the only one that can clean it. And it's only faith in him that will save you. Not cleaning yourself up a little bit, 91% and Jesus takes the 99. That's not how it works. So I'll say that to those of you who are waiting. Stop waiting. Stop adding to the gospel and simply place your faith in Jesus to do all of the work because he wants to. He already has with his death on the cross. Stop adding to the gospel. So in order to settle this matter, we see Peter stand up in verse 7 and give another great sermon. Again, just sermon after sermon we see all through Acts. And in that sermon, he recognizes the wedge between Jewish believers and Gentile believers, but reminds them that everyone, Jew and Gentile, is saved only through the grace of Jesus. Then at the end of chapter 15, we see Paul and Barnabas disagree over whether or not to, to bring John Mark with them on their next journey. And uh, unfortunately, they're not, they're not able to, uh, to reconcile that disagreement. Um, so they decide to separate. Barnabas took John Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul took a disciple named Silas. And they went through Syria and, Cicil- and Cilicia and uh, revisited and the churches they've already planted and encouraging the saints that way. So again, God is building his church. God is even using disagreements between brothers to divide and conquer, to go and cover more ground even. He even used the disagreement between Paul and Barnabas to be able to bring encouragement and bring the gospel to different places. We see that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him or are called according to his purpose, as we read in Romans. He uses everything for that. And then we get to chapter 16, which is where we left off as we we, uh, were entering into the um, Easter season. We see Timothy join up with Paul and Silas and see their work together. In uh, verse 5, we, say, we read, So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. Then we get to see how the disciples were being steered by the Holy Spirit in a very literal way. Uh, look in, verse, um, in, um, in Acts chapter 16, verse 6. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So sometimes the Spirit leads us to do things. Sometimes he prevents us from doing things. And sometimes the Spirit even leads us away from doing things that we might consider a good idea. Something that's not even like necessarily sinful, but again, if we're abiding in the Spirit, he's going to guide our paths to where that goes. It's important lesson for us to know that it's important for us to listen to the Spirit and abide in the Spirit. Spend time, spend time saturating your mind in the Scriptures. Spend time praying and listening to the guiding of the Lord because he will guide us. It, Jesus told us that his sheep will know the voice of the shepherd. So we spend time in his word, spend time in prayer. He will guide us to where we need to go. Maybe even away from things that are seemingly on the surface a good idea. Listen to the Spirit because he's going to take us in unexpected places. So with the Holy Spirit telling them not to go to Asia and preventing them from going into Bithynia, they changed course and moved through the region preaching the gospel town after town. 
That is until they make some other folks mad. Again, they keep making people mad because they're preaching the truth of the gospel. People don't like it. And they get beaten again and they get thrown in prison again. And then this is where you pick up in verse 23. Read with me. Uh, Chapter 16, verse 20. uh, I'm sorry, we're going to start in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. Y'all remember Scott bending over his sword, right? Like trying to kill, that's kind of what it looked like, right? But Paul cried out with a loud voice, do not harm yourself. We're all still here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Say that with me. What must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Praise God. God saved the guys in prison again from prison so that his gospel message could continue to go out. And the gospel continued its work immediately, didn't it? Even saving one of the guards and his whole family through the gospel that's continuing, that cannot be stopped going out to the ends of the earth. How cool is that? God is building his church. As we've seen, as we've been walking through Acts over this past year, we've seen over and over and over how God is doing exactly what he set out to do. Save sinners like you and me. And he's doing it through his church, through a community of believers who are bringing Jesus, as Jesus would say, his witnesses throughout all of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, including everyone here in this room who calls himself a Christian. And we've seen how what started here in the first century has continued through the millennia all the way up to today at Refuge Church and all the other churches around the world. We are part of the same church we're reading about here in the scriptures the church of Jesus Christ. The church that God is building then is the same church that he's building now. The people that he was adding to his church then are the same as us that are being added to his church now. So how is God building his church? One person at a time. One person who repents and believes in the gospel. One person who calls upon the name of the Lord. One person at a time. Christian, are you going to be obedient and take the gospel to your neighbor, to your coworker, to your classmates, whoever it is? Are you going to be obedient to the leading of the Spirit? As the Ethiopian eunuch said, how can they understand if someone doesn't teach them? What if it's you? What if it's you who the Spirit is using to bring the good news to them? And for those of you who aren't yet Christians, Are you going to be the next person who is saved to continue to build God's church? Again, what are you waiting for? What if today is the day you get to be part of his church? Repent and believe. It's that simple. If you have questions, please come talk to one of our pastors who will be sitting in the back. So before we do that, before we enter into a time of communion, let me pray for us.